Um, so I'm going to try and talk about the Rick's Beamline at Sector 27. Uh, I should say all of this work involves my fellow Beamline scientists, Diego Casa, Zheng Ho Kim, Ayman Saeed, and Thomas Gog. Um, so my goal in giving this talk is twofold. So first I'm going to, uh, I would like to attract new users. I think there are a lot of uh, scientific questions that, uh, or a lot of scientific problems out there that Rick's could provide some answers to. Uh, and I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to get those people here. And I'd also like to update our existing users uh, about what we're doing as the APS is upgraded, uh, the instrument will also be upgraded. So I'd like people to know what we have planned. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a lightning fast introduction to RICS and the Sector 27 beamline. Uh, I'm going to then talk about energy resolution. So I'm gonna start by talking about what energy resolution gets us as scientists. Um, you know, what additional science is permitted when you improve the energy resolution. I'm gonna take advantage of this moment to you know, also give a little bit of a smorgasbord of experiments that people have performed uh, because I think you know, they might inspire someone else with a similar problem to do the same, a similar experiment. Um, then I'm going to talk about what in specific we're doing to get better resolution at the instrument. Then I will move on to talk about sample environments. This is something we've gotten into more in recent years. Um, it really improves the number of knobs that people can turn and the, the different systems people can look at. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fields, high pressure experiments, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uniaxial strain. Um, I'm gonna focus a little more on uniaxial strain because I think it's a little more you know, atypical than, than high pressure fields. And I'm gonna finish up briefly by talking about spot size. So we're gonna have a much better focus thanks to the upgrade. And it's what new experiments will be possible with this. So um, start with this overview of resonant and elastic X-ray uh, scattering. So we are a hard X-ray beamline. RICS beamlines are divided up, and I would say most beamlines are divided up into three energy ranges. So there's soft, tender, and hard X-rays. This matters for RICS beamlines because um, you know, the, the energy range you have determines the absorption edges you can access. So in particular, hard X-rays uh, are very good for 5D transition metal L3 edges rare earth element L3 edges, and 3D transition metal K edges. There's no fundamental difference in what Rick's measures at these three different ranges. Um, it's just a difference in the optics, and you really can't get all three ranges on one beam line. Uh, so just pictorially, this is about where we measure. This is not comprehensive. so. There's doubt, talk to us. We measure, you know, 5D L3s, uh, rare earth, many of the rare earth elements. We have a new neodymium analyzer. analyzer. Um, we measure K edge uh, for 3D transition metal, for 3D transition metals. Uh, I would say for most experiments, L edges are preferred, but there are special cases when you would want to use the K edge. So, you know, for example, 99 or 95% of copper experiments are performed at the L edge. But if you, for some reason, wanted to use a higher photon energy, you wanted to look in a diamond anvil cell, if you wanted to have a larger range in reciprocal space, that would be a reason to measure at the K edge, which is higher energy. Uh, just to quickly outline the RICS process, I'm going to talk about direct RICS. There's also an indirect RICS process but I'm just gonna ignore it because this is a very broad ranging talk and not everything can be talked about, unfortunately. So direct RICS is a two-stage process. So a photon is shot in. It excites a core level electron to an unoccupied state in, the, in an unoccupied valence state. Then a bound electron drops down and a to the, the core hole and a photon is emitted. We measure the momentum and energy change of the photons. Um, so a couple things to note here. This first step is where the elemental sensitivity comes in because you tune the incident energy to a particular core level. Um, so that's nice because you know your results 
relate to that particular element. Uh, and then Rex is sensitive to both unoccupied and, un and occupied states. Um, if I were to describe it in one sentence, I would say we measure local and collective electronic excitations. Some of the excitations we measure are phonons, magnons, DD excitations, and charge transfer excitations, uh, not all on one spectra. Um, this is a typical Rick spectra. This is a fairly recent measurement. It's a, an ear date. So here you can see the elastic line. Uh, most of the, well, many of the photons don't lose any energy. They're just in and out. So that lets you zero, it, it sets the zero for energy loss. And out here at about 0.7 EV, you can see an excitation. Uh, this happens to be a DD excitation. So it's the energy difference between an unoccupied and, un and occupied D state. So now I'm going to talk about what energy resolution gets us as scientists, what experiment it allows, um, and you know, what improvements in energy resolution will allow. So I'm gonna start uh, by taking a step back. So there's always this trade-off, right, between energy resolution and counts. So the tighter your energy resolution, the fewer counts you have. And there's this tension between, you know, wanting a really good energy resolution and making the experiment very clean and being able to take the data in a reasonable amount of time. And that has in some ways inhibited very tight energy resolution. Um, this constraint is about to change dramatically. The APS ring is being upgraded. It will be shut down for about a year uh, in a little in 2023, uh, beginning in 2023. But the ring upgrade is going to give us a lot more count. So there'll be a two to three orders of magnitude increase in brilliance. Brilliance is sort of a you know term of art for synchrotron people, but it's what you want. It's more photons, less divergence, less bandwidth. Um, there will also be coherent flux after this ring upgrade. I don't know how Rix will use this, but I'm gonna mention it in case someone here has a, a good idea they wanna share. Um, along with this ring upgrade, the Rix instrument will also be upgraded. It will be upgraded to allow better energy resolution. Uh, we'll have more sample environments and there will be a tighter focus at the sample. So the spot size on the sample will be smaller. Um, so, Right now, our absolutely record best energy resolution is just under 10 MeV at the iridium L3 edge. Um, in the last couple of years, we've done a lot of work on iridium compounds, so there's been a lot of focus on improving resolution here. Um, it's actually, it's one of the tricky things about running a resonant beamline is that, um, you know, for every optic, you need to be able, or you need to do many different energies. So you can't just have one optic and you can't just have one, an optical scheme that works at one energy. You have to be able to you know, just replace a few parts or move things around and switch energies quite a bit. Um, this is a very difficult instrument to run at sub 10 MeV. So it's really expert mode, expert user only right now. Um, it's just not something we can teach people to run within a couple hours so that they can do an experiment. Um, so after the upgrade, this is planned to be a user instrument. So it's something to look forward to. Um, so with this 10 MeV resolution, uh, this beautiful measurement was done where a magnon was measured at the iridium L3 edge, about 40 MeV. You can see here is the elastic line and here is this beautiful magnon peak. And just to show how far we've come, I wanted to compare that to this 2008 measurement at 120 MeV resolution. This is a bimagnon measure of the copper K edge. I was a postdoc for John Hill when this paper was in the works. And I remember what a tremendous technical effort it was. Um, you, know, you can see this is a tiny bump on the side of a huge elastic line. Each of these scans took 12 hours. It was a tremendous effort to make sure that this bump was, was a real feature of the sample and not you know, some optical aberration or noise or something like that. Um, there are a number of reasons why the spectra on the right looks better than the spectra on the left. Uh, there's a more favorable geometry on the right, which wasn't possible in 2008. There is, um, you know, it's the L edge. 
in 2008, I don't believe copper L edge was possible anywhere in the world. Uh, but resolution is obviously a key feature in making the measurement of a 40 MeV peak possible. Um, you know, the energy scales in these two plots are different. And if you shrink down the plot on the right, you can see how much better the resolution really is. Uh, this entire plot is six points on the left-hand scan. And it's all the way over here, just totally buried in the elastic line. Uh, so, so one advantage of much better resolution is that it makes it possible to measure much lower features. And even now, when we routinely run at about 35 MeV, we run into this. So this is another iridate example. Um, by careful fitting, they were able to get out a very nice dispersion of this magnon. Um, and it's, it's believable when you look at the, the paper, but think how much nicer it would be if the data had spoken more for itself, if this elastic line were a lot sharper and easier to take off the magnon peak. And I'll point to this data too. This is obviously not publication form. This is uh, SI, uh, strontium iridate 113 data. Um, it's never been published and it has no prospect of being published because you can see a magnon here, but it's basically, uh, I've never been able to make a convincing fit to this given the size of the elastic line. I mean, it's basically a shoulder on the elastic line. Um, so a much sharper energy resolution would make this peak much clearer. Um, there are also, so yeah, better resolution will make lower energy peaks uh, more visible. It will also open up a new class of experiment. So I wanna talk a little bit about a 2010 paper. Um, this is Hassan Yabash's thesis work. So, um, Hassan wanted to know what happens when you measure phonons at a resonant edge. So right now, phonons are measured with non-resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. It's a fixed optics uh, to about 20 keV typically, uh, and the resolution is one and a half MeV-ish. This is done here at sector 30 at ESRF at many different synchrotrons around the world. I mean, Alfred Barron, of course. Um, but measuring it at, at a resonant edge was a new idea. So Hassan manufactured some special optics um, to allow what was at the time ultra low resolution. So he was able to measure 38 MeV resolution at the copper K edge. Um, this is, by the way, shortly after this measurement, 120, this measurement, I keep pointing at the screen, uh, 120 MeV. Um, so you can see what a tremendous accomplishment 38 MeV was at that time. Now, phonons range in energy from about zero to 200 MeV. So 38 is still a pretty you know, broad energy resolution to measure them with. So given that um, this is sort of a test experiment, they have a special optic, uh, they don't really know what's gonna happen. They, they measured a, a well-known compound, which is copper oxide. So Hassan made these very challenging measurements. Uh, you can see he measured at a few different incident energies. Um, and he collaborated with Michelle Van Bindal, a theorist here at APS. And their basic conclusion was that the intensity of a phonon peak at the resonant edge is proportional to the amount of electron phonon coupling. It's actually a very powerful result. But in 2010 with uh, 38 MeV, um, it was very theoretical. As we reduce the resolution to 10 uh, and below, it starts to seem more practical. This is a, a type of experiment I think in five years we're gonna be seeing much more of, even three or four. Um, now, having, having made this plea for low energy resolution, I'm gonna take a, a step back and talk about some, uh, so, so having made a plea for very uh, fine energy resolution, I'm gonna now say that, that coarser res energy resolution is still important. Um, I'm just going to quickly outline two uh, different experiments that were measured at much lower energy resolution. I'm going to, I picked these two because uh, they're very practical experiments that so they answer a question a lot of people ask. And I suspect that some people listening might want to uh, do this kind of experiment. Um, so the first example I kind of love because it involves um, a very clear result from a very low resolution, from a very broad resolution. 
So uh, there's a, an ytterbium indium copper has two condo temperatures. Um, at 43 Kelvin, there's some kind of valence transition. And at the low temperature, there's a much higher condo coupling. Uh, in 2002, ESRF uh, did a measurement at 1.3 EV resolution, and they saw this very exciting result. So this is uh, measuring uh, ytterbium emission uh, above and below the transition temperature. So th there are two things. So there's a big change in the spectra. So clearly ytterbium electrons are, are important in this transition. And the interpretation of the spectra is that there's a lot more ytterbium 2 plus below the transition. Uh, I should say that this, this is an ESRF measurement, but this is the type of measurement that's done at uh, sector Y, yeah, sector 20 now, uh, Laric, which is a beam line that Jerry's quite involved in. Um, so it's a very interesting and provocative result. I did want to take a moment here to say why they're doing RICS and not, for example, ARPES. So ARPES is clearly a very direct measure of electrons. So, uh, you know, the ARPES is very surface sensitive. And a mixed valence state, a system like this, um, you often have strange surfaces, you can have electronic reconstructions, um, all sorts of strange things. So ARPES can be very, you know, very interesting results. And then you want to look for consistency with a bulk technique like RICS. So fast forward to 2015, um, Ignaz Sharaj and Jason Hancock uh, decided to take a look at the lower energy loss spectra of this sample. So in, uh, they knew to look at the ytterbium 2 plus because of the previous experiment. Um, so they tuned the incident energy so they would be looking at ytterbium 2 plus states. Uh, this is a rather complicated spectrum. So, Two big things to notice are, so first off, black is high temperature, blue is low temperature, and green is calculation. There is a, a shift in the spectra, um, and there's a change in the intensity in the gap. Uh, and this is all measured with 200 MeV resolution, although frankly, they may not have even needed that, um, just looking at the data. This is quite a complicated spectra. Um, so to understand what, what these results mean, uh, they collaborated with a theorist. And the basic answer is that there's a D-band shift uh, in the ytterbium, and that uh, at low temperature, there are four times the number of electrons at the Fermi level than there are at high temperature. Um, so this, and that changes the condo temperature. So this rather low energy uh, measurement, sorry, low resolution measurement um, answered a, a, temper, a question about very low energy electrons. The second example I just wanted to quickly touch on is uh, DD excitations in this iridate. Um, so this is uh, this is the same spectra I showed. It's like a sample Rick spectra. Here's the elastic line. Here's the DD excitations. Um, the sample has two structural transitions, so this represents all three phases. Um, their real interest was to look to see how close to a J effect of one half spectra, uh, system this is. So they're looking for low distortions and really what they want here is one peak, which unfortunately they don't, they almost have, but not quite. Um, and you can see the evolution of the uh, splitting here. Um, this actually was kind of a crazy experiment. It was measured in June of 2020, at which time site access was extremely limited. I wasn't allowed on site. Diego Casa fortunately was able to get access. He snuck in one day, or he was allowed in one day, uh, put the sample, which fortunately was already mounted, he put the sample on the displex, turned on the displex and left. So one reason they have such a fine data set here is that we measured the sample for two or three days um, because we, we couldn't get back on site to put another sample on yet. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pause and take, so I hope I've, Convince you that better resolution will allow more experiments, but that um, low resolution is also helpful. So with that, I wanted to pause and uh, take a break for questions. All right, there's several questions. Um, oh. for, uh, no, they're good questions, it's all good, it's all good. The um, uh, first one is you mentioned the ESRF um, uh, result with the two condo temperatures, am I remembering mm -hmm. that correctly? Yeah. Was that RICS or was that um, NRICS? Um, 
That was, okay, that is true. That was Enrix. Oh, okay. Um, All right, that's fine. Yeah. So then it, it makes sense that, that that could be at sector twenty. Okay, yeah. that's that, that's fine. I just I got a little confused there. Fair um, enough. Um, okay, so uh, a bunch of questions. One is, what's the natural line width for magnons? I don't. Uh, frankly, I don't know. Um, I don't think we are limited by that yet. So we're we're not at that point. Um, some of them are, some of them are very broad. Mm -hmm. um, so in in one one three, obviously they're very broad. Um, there are some, actually, I think it's 214, where if you heat it above the transition temperature, the magnon kind of melts. So you can see that the, the, um, the line shape gets even broader. And you know, this presumably refer, is reflective of uh, the correlation length, right? Damping, so it becomes yeah. a much more local excitation. Got it. Okay, next uh, question. Uh, Gabriel, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Mary. Uh, my question Hi. is, how does one differentiate between local versus collective excitations from Rex measurements? So I haven't um, done Rex myself. I, I think this has been partially answered by an audience member, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I, I would say basically looking at the dispersion that a local excitation will not have reciprocal space dispersion. Um, I'm curious to know what the, uh, the, you know, what other people say, but very, very, very similar in the, okay. uh, yeah. in yeah. the comments. Yes, yes, uh, everyone, everyone's on the same page. Okay. Well, okay. you never know. I mean, people tell me new things all the time, even after a decade of doing this. There's always new, new stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Yang Ha, you had a question. Yeah, it's it's a entry level question. So how does this like a Riggs resolution you're talking about the link to your excitation energy resolution? So, um, you know, of course you can't measure a feature width below your resolution of the of the instrument. Um, yeah. So in particular, with phonon measurements, you know, I think the intrinsic width of phonons is around one MeV. So if you measure uh, with a five MeV resolution, you know, everything's going to look like it's 5 MeV and you won't be capturing the natural width. Okay. okay. Uh, does that work for you, Yang Ha? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Yulia, you had a question? Um, yeah, so I just want to clarify. So all the results you presented, they are for single crystals. Is this correct? I believe so. Um, we do sometimes measure, possibly with the exception of that. Um, no, they're all for single crystals. Yeah, so basically, um, if we want to utilize this technique, we have to have a nice single crystal material, yeah? Not, not necessarily. We've definitely done powder measurements. Um, you can run into trouble because, so, okay, so some of the measurements I presented were film measurements. Um, we can do powder measurements. The uh, technical problem is that the elastic line is a lot bigger for that type of measurement. So if you want to measure, you know, a really low energy feature, it's better to have a single crystal. Um, and of course, if you want reciprocal space resolution, you need a single crystal or a well-grown film or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have a powder, we can definitely take a look at it. Yeah, so basically uh, what I was um, going into is um, perovskites, yeah? So there is a lot of discussion of perovskites used for solar cells. And I'm wondering if you measure or you're going to present any results for those materials. I'm not, but um, there's a, an old paper from uh, Peter Abamante where he does measure an exciton in um, lithium something. Um, and it's, it's actually just lovely. He inverts the reciprocal space and energy data to make a real space picture or image of of the excitation. Um, but his interest was the technique, uh, not the exciton. Although, of course, you can imagine doing this, measuring an exciton for a solar cell. But they're quite low energy, aren't they? What, what, uh, what's an exciton uh, energy in a... This is more kind of general uh, question because I think there is still a lot of debate on how perovskite-based solar cells work. Some of oh. them are very efficient, but the physics beyond uh, behind that is not very clear. So I was kind of wondering if you are trying to actively contribute to that field. 
Not yet, but you've you've gotten me interested. I, I have to say, this is something. Um, gosh, I think Jerry has a student. I think Jerry told me right before this talk, he has a student coming out here to do battery research at the synchrotron. Um, and definitely, Larix has done a bit of, which is a non-resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, has done a lot of battery research. Um, but we have not yet. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, uh, I'll ask people to keep typing their questions into um, into the chat, and you should continue, Mary. Thank you for uh, thank you for taking the questions. Thank you. So, um, I, I've given sort of a smorgasbord of different experiments. Now, I want to talk about some technical details about how we get better resolution. So, I'm going to start talking about energy resolution before the sample. Um, so this is my, my cartoon of Rick's optics. You know, we have photons, we put them through a monochromator. There are focusing optics. Uh, the monochromatic focus beam hit the sample. The sam uh, photons are emitted from the sample. And uh, we measure the momentum and energy change of the emitted photons. Um, here's, here's our actual instrument here. The, the monochromator is over here. This is our photons come down here, this pipe, this is our mirror tank, sample position, and all of this is for uh, measuring the energy and momentum of emitted photons. Um, the energy resolution has several components, so what I want to talk about now is the bandwidth of the incident photons. Talk about this after the post-sample energy resolution later. You know, the focusing, the detector, and things like that are all important also, but I'm just going to skip it. Um, so yeah, let's start by talking about uh, monochromatic, how do we make monochromatic photons. So right now, we have sort of two optical schemes for monochromatizing photons. Um, let me start by issuing a couple of disclaimers. So first off, our primary monochromator is diamond 111. So this gets the beam down from 70 EV-ish, which comes out of the undulator, down to 1 EV-ish, uh, which then goes into the secondary monochromator. All of the changes I'm talking about are the secondary monochromator. Uh, and second, when I'm talking about resolution at this time, I'm talking about the resolution of the instrument of the incident beam, not the total resolution. So with those caveats in place, um, let me carry on. The first scheme we have is a, a four bounce monochromator. This was originally designed to give 70 MeV resolution and 100 MeV resolution, depending on the choice of crystals. So we have two crystals mounted, two sets of crystals mounted right next to each other. Um, in recent years, we've also started using the 440 reflection, which gives about 40 MeV. Uh, we also use a single channel cut right now. Um, so this is a channel cut diagram. It's basically a single piece of crystal with two faces cut out. The beam hits the first face, second face, and comes out monochromatized. Well, comes out with a tighter bandwidth. Um, this, for example, we use 844 for Iridium L3 edge. It's a very good incident resolution of 15 MeV. The downside is that um, if you, to change the energy, you have to rotate the crystal and that moves the beam because of course you can see that the, you know, this distance will change and it makes the beam move up and down. Um, you know, going forward in the immediate future and by which I mean the end of 2021, we're going to put two silicon 844 channel cuts in vacuum. So this will only be suitable for iridium L3 experiments, which is probably about half of the experiments we do right now. So the incident resolution will be nine MeV. The big advantage is that you'll be able to change the energy without moving the beam. And the reason is that you know, as you rotate the first pair, you also rotate the second pair and the movements compensate for each other. Um, in the upgrade, along with the upgrade of the ring, we're going to upgrade our monochromators. So we have sort of two resolution goals. So the first is we want a very wide range where we have uh, pretty good res medium resolution, shall we say. So we're going to have uh, 50 MeV resolution between about 6 kV and 12 keV um, using different crystals uh, with a different miscut um, at 
with, with a very similar physical setup, it's still four bounds. Um, to get even better resolution in a more narrow incident energy range, we can use the 440 or the 660 uh, reflections. And then for the 5D uh, L3 edges, we also wanted to have extremely good incident resolution. So to do that, we're gonna keep using this first pair and we're going to use a different second and third pair. So the, the outer pairs will both be silicon 222 and the central pair will be silicon 931. Um, this is a restricted to a, from about 10 to 12 keV, which is most of the 5D L3s. Um, this is a different beast mechanically, six, six crystals. Um, you know, it's gonna take some thought into how to keep it stable. You know, also, frankly, because um, you know, the resolution is so much better, uh, you know, the, the just inherently less stable. Um, so this is sort of uh, our plan for pre-sample optics before the, uh, going along with the ring upgrade. Um, also, there's energy resolution after the sample, and this is something Jerry has done a lot with. Um, so, you know, the sample emit photons, and we have to measure the energy and momentum. Um, we basically have a different kind of monochromator to measure the energy. So we put the emitted photons through an analyzer, which select a particular energy, and shoot that to a detector. We currently use um, a dice crystal analyzer. So this program was started by Diego Casa and has been advanced in recent years by Ayman Saeed. Uh, this is Ayman remounting our diamond monocrystal. Um, this is a, basically it's a silicon wafer, mostly use silicon right now, uh, diced and bonded to a slightly curved plastic frame. Um, you know, cutting the silicon without putting in strain is an art. Uh, bonding it to the plastic is an art. Um, it's a lot of technical work to figure out how to do this. Um, and there are some limits and we're, we're trying to push the edge of those limits. So right now, these are all made with silicon and germanium. And one of the key issues is what is high quality and easily available. You have to make one for every different edge you measure. Um, so unless you're, it's not practical to, to grow silicon and germanium uh, just for this purpose. You just have to buy wafers. Um, so in fact, germanium is increasingly off the table because it's getting more and more expensive and harder to get. Ideally you want to use, but we can start moving beyond silicon and germanium too. So ideally what you want is a lot of reflections close to backscattering. So you want the detector and the sample to be as close as possible. And the reason for that is um, you get, frankly, better intensity and any figure error, like if the, uh, the curvature isn't perfect, is less important in that geometry. Um, low symmetry helps because you're gonna have more reflections. So you presumably have more options. Um, with that in mind, we started I think Thomas did these calculations initially. Uh, just, you know, if you look at different crystals, what has a lot of reflection? So here's, this is a, an example for iridium. Silicon, germanium, use silicon. The, the width of this line indicates the count rate you're gonna get out. Um, you know, there's a reason we're not using germanium, which is a slightly better res or slightly worse resolution and far worse count rate. Um, sapphire looks really good. Unfortunately, sapphire crystals are not, can't, you can't buy sapphire wafers of sufficient quality. And quartz looks very interesting. I mean, there's so many reflections here and it, the resolution is better, uh, is, is better. Um, so yeah, I mean, we also looked at lithium niobate, but again, you can't buy good quality wafers. So uh, Ayman started exploring quartz um, and, you know, learning how to cut quartz and uh, bond it to a, a bond it to the, the, the plastic curved model, it took a lot of effort, uh, but he was ultimately successful. Uh, and this is a, a recently, not maybe not that recently published uh, measurement um, of uh, an iridate where they used the quartz model. 
the uh, quartz analyzer contribution was 3.7 MeV, which is much, much better than uh, eight, silicon 844. Um, given the incident photons and the geometry constraints, the total resolution is just above 10 MeV. Uh, so the black measurement here is with the quartz analyzer and the red is with the silicon. Um, obviously, the quartz analyzer is much sharper. The count rate is also much worse. It's about uh, two orders of magnitude worse. Uh, three, three orders of magnitude worse. Now, um, that's not great. About an order of magnitude and a half is because the area of the, of the solid angle collected is smaller. Um, and, you know, potentially going forward, this could be improved. Right now, you know, this is not an analyzer for every experiment, but it is an analyzer for, you know, looking for that 25 MeV feature. Um, I'm being on time. So the, uh, the, the other thing you can start thinking about for post sample analysis is uh, to go stop using crystal analyzers, dice crystal analyzers. Um, so Zheng Ho pioneered this practical application of this optical setup. Um, this is, you know, uses a Montel mirror to collect some solid angle and then uses flat crystals to perform the energy analysis. Um, this is a whole talk, this system is a whole talk in and of itself, uh, which Zheng Ho is much more qualified to give but they did get just below 10 MeV with it. Uh, and this is currently planned to become a user instrument after the upgrade. We need significant mechanical uh, changes to make it practical. So this is, concludes my section on energy resolution. Um, so I think the energy resolution is uh, you know, gonna be getting better, uh, will allow us to measure lower energy features and hopefully we'll start to see people measure phonons at resonant edges. Um, I'm just going to talk quickly about exotic sample environments. And to me, exotic sample in, an exotic sample environment is anything that is not a displex. Um, so I just would like to start by pointing out that RICS is a field-friendly technique. Um, you know, I come, my thesis work was on ARPES, which is a tremendously powerful technique, but it's a photon in, electron out technique, which means you can never do an ARPES measurement in a magnetic field because uh, you know, when you measure the momentum and energy of the photon or of the electron that's emitted, uh, you know, it's gonna be completely distorted by the electric field. Rick's is photon in, photon out, so you can actually do measurements of a sample in a field. Um, we've done one measurement in a field uh, and it was both very simple and very clever. So in this case, the sample, they really just wanted to measure it above and below a, a critical field. Um, this is, just a small sample holder, and they glued a, uh, or attached a commercial magnet in it, the kind of thing you can buy at Home Depot. They were able to get a two Tesla field at the sample. Uh, and you can see that they measured a, a magnon. This was a crazy experiment. They needed the 10 MeV for this too. They, uh, and at zero field, they basically saw no gap, or they saw a significant gap in the magnon and then when they applied the field, the, phone, the magnon softened significantly and pretty much went down to zero. And this was just published, I think last week or so. High pressure is also something we can do. So this is an example of a time when you, you know, even if you're measuring copper, where you might think an L3 edge experiment and the soft RICS is favorable, um, I can't, I'm not aware of any high pressure cell that you'd be able to use at sub 1 keV with sub 1 keV photons because all the photons will be absorbed by the cell. Um, but you can definitely measure it at higher X-ray energies. And Zheng Ho has put a tremendous amount of work into this and made them as close to routine as they can get. So we have the, you know, the membrane cells so you can change the pressure in situ, the Ruby analyzer so you can know the pressure you're applying by looking at the Ruby Raman system, or Ruby Raman uh, signal. Um, I'm just gonna briefly mention this because uh, it's something that we can do pretty routinely. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was uniaxial strain. So this is a little more exotic. I think it's newer. Um, 
there's more interest in this now because people are looking more at design to sample. So, you know, if I want to tailor the properties of a superconductor or a silicon chip, I can start growing it layer by layer. This is, and, and strain is just part of this kind of sample design. Um, simulation is definitely driving this because, of course, you can, you know, test a sample in simulation much more easily than you can by actually growing it and then measuring it. Um, so we have a commercial system. Uh, this is a Razorbill cell. We just bought it from Razorbill. It fits on a displex. Um, you mount the sample here uh, across a, a trench, you can see here. And then the two piezo stacks you know, either push or pull the sample apart and apply strain. Um, we currently have kind of a medium-sized cell, which provides moderate strain. We've just put in a purchase order for a larger strain. And the strain you apply is roughly measured by a capacitor, which is applied. Of course, diffraction, a, a capacitor between the two stacks. And of course, diffraction is a real way to measure the strain you're applying to your sample. Um, this is one solution. I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of individual efforts. This is uh, Shua Sanchez, who's uh, about to graduate with his PhD from the University of Washington. Um, you know, also Phil Ryan at Sector 6 is really leading the APS effort to develop this, to uh, implement this technology. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Chu's group at University of Washington and Young Jun Kim. And I'm just listening here at the people I know. I know a lot more is happening. Uh, we can try and skip a few slides here. There's some effort involved in mounting the sample. We can help you with that if you want to do it. Um, the kind of experiment that you might be interested in doing. So this is a phase diagram for strained neodymium nickel oxide. Um, and this diagram is made by growing the film on a lot of different substrates to apply different strain. And so there's a tremendous technical effort to grow the films. And you end up with a rather coarse data set. You, 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 know, you basically measure the temperature dependence of each one of these lines. And there's always this question about whether it's, this, it's very intriguing and you, it looks very interesting and it is very interesting, but there's always a question, you know, is it a substrate effect? You know, is the substrate doping the sample in some way? And particularly, you know, when you have this very narrow range phase here. Um, so we did a little RICS measurement on this and we used two strain films. So basically we had two strain data points and we measured the temperature up and down these films. And we did see a strain effect. Uh, the DD excitation, the DD, sorry, crystal field splitting. And then there was a change in the occupancy at high and low temperature above this phase transition. Um, but you know what would be a really great experiment is this. So to be able, instead of measuring up and down in temperature, to pick your temperature and measure across and strain. And that this kind of strain technology is going to allow this. Other things uh, you could imagine doing are um, perovskite rotations. So, you know, perovskite rotations are really important in a lot of different samples, superconductors and multiporosity. And applying strain can allow you to unwind these rotations. Um, so here's an example where the, they basically induced the uh, a, an unwinding of the, of the rotations with helium doping. And they saw a really interesting effect here. Um, but if you can do it with a physical method, uh, it's a little easier. You don't, for example, you don't have to grow so many different samples. Um, also, if you want to detwin a sample, so this is an example where uh, the sample was detwinned by a strain. They, they had a very clever technique they basically bent the sample with a cantilever, and then they observed uh, an in-plane resistance and isotropy they've never known about before. Um, Detwinning has been observed uh, in using this kind of uniaxial strain at sector six, uh, and so this is another thing that you know one could consider exploring. I should say you, you have to measure the sample under strain because the twin pattern is restored after the strain release. Um, so I'm just going to finish up by very briefly talking about the stop, spot side. Oh, sorry, I should take questions again. Just just a few questions. Uh, sure. Gabriel, you had a question? Uh, yes. Uh, 
So Mary, I was wondering what um, equipment is available at the beamline for keeping samples in inner atmosphere, like, uh, you know, like flowing nitrogen or argon or something. Uh, so well in measurement or in storage? Uh, well, during the measurement. Oh, so yeah, we um, honestly, for, for samples that react, we typically just put them in the displex, even if we don't want to um, cool them because it's a, a keeps them under rough vacuum. And we have a beryllium dome, which is virtually transparent to x-rays. Um, we have done, we do have a little helium dome, which we've, uh, it's also beryllium. So we've in the past uh, basically made a little helium um, ampule uh, with a beryllium top and a copper base, uh, which we use for some um, intercalated graphite compounds, which, you know, they completely react with air and just turn into a hot mess. Yeah, the, the low vacuum, I think, could work because I'm working on these halide perovskite single crystals. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's nice to take that precaution to try to avoid oxygen and air exposure uh, when I the mean, beam's on the sample. Yeah, so, so is it only when the beam's on the sample or is it? Yeah, mostly when the beam's on the sample because there are photo excitations. Oh yeah, so we can definitely just pop that on the, the displex and pump on it. Um, we certainly don't want to, we have burned samples in the past. We try not to do that again. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Matthew Marcus, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering about uh, X-ray Raman, which of course is a related technique, and would the low red setup be useful for that, or should that be done in some other beam line? I would say in general that's done, so it depends sort of, I can, imagine, yes, um, <laughs> I can imagine some cases where the energy resolution would be beneficial, but there are other beam lines that have large arrays of many, um, uh, uh, of many analyzers uh, uh, to give much higher solid angle, and um, they're sort of more optimized for the, uh, the NREX. Uh, so, but I can imagine there'll be some cases where uh, um, you're doing like a 3D transition metal L-edge Raman and you really want to see every little piece of multiplet structure, and that's just outside the energy resolution of the dedicated Raman instruments. Uh -huh. And also, I imagine another possible use case would be where you're doing you're doing your your normal RICS experiment on a system that has light elements in it as well, and uh, you'd want to be able to pick up the uh, uh, pick up the XAS on the light element. Although that may be too impractical due to equipment change. I uh, have not thought about that second case, but I would say in general, when people want to do X-ray Raman, they're typically better off at Laric, which is sector 20. Uh -huh. uh, as Jerry said, we have done a couple of special cases where they, you know, they did want the finer resolution, um, but, you know, Laric looks like a stegosaurus. They have something like 20 analyzers. We have one analyzer. It's just much slower. Right. Okay, thanks. You should continue, Mary. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to briefly touch on spot size. Um, so this is something we're getting for free from the expert, from the APS upgrade. So this is a picture of the electron beam um, today. So you can see it's quite broad and short. After the upgrade, it's going to be more symmetric. So our spot size will immediately go from about 10 by 40 microns to 10 by 10 microns. Um, this is comparable to our penetration depth in many cases. This is gonna make a lot of experiments easier and uh, we'll make some of them better. So currently when we do a high pressure experiment, the sample is about 25 microns by 100 microns wide. And our beam is the full width half max, 10 by 40. So it's not so dissimilar. Um, it just we end up throwing away some beam, which is unfortunate. Uh, I would say also for, for film measurements, we go to grazing incidents uh, and we end up throwing away beam because our 40 micron width just misses the sample. Um, also for grown samples, you know, it's not really, it's very hard to make, you know, samples like this uniform over a large area. 
So the smaller spot you have, the more uniform area you're going to me measure. Also, for things like magnetic domains, twinning domains, a lot of them have are in the you know 10 to 40 micron range. So when you reduce the size of the spot, you can start looking at one domain. Uh, oh, and I took questions uh, pretty late, but that was oh my conclusion now. Okay. So first, if you want to measure an electronic excitation, please talk to us. We love new users. We always love exciting samples. Um, we're a pretty friendly bunch. Um, we're going to have much better energy resolution going forward, and we're having increasingly sophisticated sample environments. Um, and so with that, I'll take any final questions. Thank you. That was, uh, that was wonderful to see. Um, it looks like there's a, a follow-up question from Matthew about uh, source size effects. Yeah, I was wondering if the improved spot size will, you know, will, it will get rid of some of the source size effect on analyzer resolution and maybe allow you to use a more compact analyzer. Um, I, I think the, the source size affects the resolution uh, because it affects sort of the, um, the, 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 what's going into the analyzer. By a more compact analyzer, what do you mean? Well, the, uh, the source size effect on resolution is you know, basically it would scale with the spot size divided by the distance between sample and analyzer. So if you say have the, the spot size, you'd be able to have the size of everything. And so you'd have a smaller, lighter analyzer set up in principle. Okay, like the, so yeah, that's okay. I yeah, understand what you mean. Yeah, like um, the stuff that Jerry's done with the mini XA, the mini XES. Yeah, that's great, by the way. I'm always telling people to go down there when they have that kind of experiment. <laughs> um, I, so a lot of the spot size advantage we're getting will be in the horizontal uh, and the analyzer is ah. in vertical scattering. So, uh, However, you know, focusing optics are basically commercial. So at some point, we're going to throw more money at this and end up with a better spot size. So yeah, you, I mean, at that time, we can definitely reduce it. I, I will say, though, when we reduce the spot size, we tend to just be happy about the lower resolution. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically make analyzers of one meter and two meter right now. And we right now only really use two meters at least in 90% of cases. Um, so I think we would just be happier to have the resolution, although you do make a good point about, you know, because there still is a lot of physics there at, you know, the 200 MeV range, and they could start going more and more to one, to one meter. Right, but I guess the disadvantage of a smaller spot size is you burn the sample more easily. <laughs> that very seldom happens. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, um, the other thing we've done sometimes is uh, we've just moved the sample continuously through the yeah. measurement, uh -huh. um, which relies on having a very good uniform sample, but you can do it. Okay. Um, uh, I had uh, one last question. It's a little bit of trivia, but... 10, 15 years ago when I was looking at quartz for quartz analyzers, I was told that the only reliable supply was the remaining former Soviet quartz as it was known. And I'm just curious if that's, uh, if that's still the case or if there's modern quartz manufacturer that meets spec. I, I, I am confident, although not 100% confident that there's a, a modern quartz manufacturer okay. because um, I can't imagine that we, we I mean, and this is really Iman's baby. I mean, Iman would be the person to talk to about this, but I can't imagine that he would go through all the effort of developing this technology with such an un, you know, uncertain source. Well, there used to be big bulls of it laying around, but, but Thomas, I see you're here. Do you have a comment? Can I actually answer that question? So it turns out that good quartz crystals also make good quartz oscillators for military purposes. There's a company in Japan in particular by the name of Murata who makes tremendously great quartz for that purpose. And every now and then, if you get lucky, they will send you a bull for about 5K or 10K. 
so yes, there are companies that make this and it's partially very secret. So it's hard to get, but every now and then we get lucky. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, so I started with uh, 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 one trivia and it was corrected to uh, a different but more correct uh, uh, trivia. That's, uh, that's great.